So I think we can all agree that 2022 was a great year for DC, with releases like The Batman, Peacemaker, Season 2 of Superman and Lois, and DC's League of Super Pets. It's very clear that Warner Brothers' DC catalogue has undoubtedly improved. Unfortunately for Batgirl. You can't keep getting away with it! And while some amazing projects were released this year, that didn't stop Warner Brothers from facing a potential bankruptcy. Where is the money? One of DC's amazing projects was the Sandman Netflix series, a televised adaptation of Neil Gaiman's graphic novel of the same name, which ran from 1989 until 1996. In the years passing after the novel's release, many attempts have been made to adapt it onto both the big and small screens, to minimal success, leading to the Sandman being labelled as unfilmable, at least until May 26th, 2021, when the underpaid teenager who runs Netflix's official Twitter account announced the immensely talented cast of the long-awaited televised adaptation of Neil Gaiman's novel, featuring a majority cast of knife crime committers, so if you're exhausted of all the American casts, <coughs> this is the show for you. National discrimination aside, the show was a success, with it being Netflix's most viewed show worldwide for three weeks, as well as recently being renewed for a second season. And while the show is of high quality, it has one fatal flaw that might go right over a viewer's head, but to me, it matters quite a lot. Allow me to explain. When it comes to the analysis or critique of comic book related media, one thing that's rarely discussed is how well a TV series or film adapts the source material it's based off of, and whenever the discussion is had, it usually surrounds if said film or TV series is a bad adaptation. But the question is, what makes a good adaptation? Two things that I believe are crucial to making a good adaptation are faithfulness and deviation. What I mean by faithfulness is that you need to keep key aspects from the comics. For example, Spider-Man and Responsibility, Batman and his no killing rule, Deadpool and his fourth wall breaks. Then there's deviation, which is taking either an idea, storyline, or not so important character trait from the comics and diverging it away from the original. However, these divergences can be either very subtle or very noticeable. It's like playing Russian roulette with comic book fans. But these deviations exist to create a sense of transformation. One film which does a really good job of its deviations from the comics is the best on-screen adaptation of Batman, from Matt Reeves' film The Batman. In most comic storylines, Bruce Wayne is portrayed as a socialite, making appearances at events with his billionaire brethren, whereas in Matt Reeves' adaptation, Bruce Wayne is a social recluse with an aversion to going outside. Bruce's lack of social interaction works here, and also makes more sense than being a social butterfly. Fuck you because it demonstrates that his parents' death affects him on a social level as well as a moral one. Another one of these divergences revolves around the film's antagonist, the Riddler. In the comics, Riddler is portrayed as a flamboyant, obsessive egocentrist you got me. who is focused on outsmarting Batman, whereas in Matt Reeves' adaptation, he shares some of the character traits, but his focus is on exposing Gotham's corruption instead of outsmarting Batman. In addition to the Batman, there are many other great adaptations which follow the faithfulness and deviation formula, such as Into the Spider-Verse, the Boys, Netflix's The Punisher, as well as Superman and Lois, just to name a few. Now what is generally considered a bad adaptation is where a TV show or film takes a character and drives said character so far away from the source material, they are unrecognisable. And this has happened with numerous characters like Thor, Moon Knight, Hulk, and Spider-Man to a certain extent. What makes these massive divergences a bad thing is that the original author's intention with the character has been pissed on and hit with a car. Once you lose the key things which make your character who they are, you create misconceptions around said character. And with the advent of comic book cinema, people are more likely to watch a movie or TV series than to read a comic or graphic novel. But what about the other side of the coin? What about a show or movie that sticks too close to the source material? Well, that's a bad adaptation too. Consistency? Mind-blowing, I know. Don't worry, straying too far from the source material and clinging onto the source material are bad things for their own reasons, and since I've already explained why the former is bad, allow me to explain the latter. Treating the source material like it's gospel and grabbing onto it for dear life echoes a lack of creativity. As I mentioned earlier, the makings of a good adaptation involve both being faithful to the source material and deviating from said source material, with said deviations being made to adapt the source material into the world the writer is trying to create, and a lack of deviation means a lack of creativity, with no deviation you might as well read the source material. On the topic of reading, some things from the comics just don't translate very well onto the screen. Adapting 22 pages into a 50 minute TV episode definitely won't make your viewers want to toss themselves off of a high ledge. Oh. 
An example of a show which does stick a bit too close to its source material is the topic of today's video, The Sandman. While I did suck the toes of the series in the opening of this video, its one predominant flaw is that it feels too tethered to Neil Gaiman's novel, treating it as if it were gospel. In preparation for this video, I read the first 16 issues of the Sandman comic, or the first two volumes, which the show adapts and condenses into 10 episodes. And throughout the series' 10 episode runtime, you can split the show's adaptation quality into three sections. One section where the show deviates too far from the source material, another where the show stays too tethered to the source material, and a near perfect amalgamation of faithfulness and deviation. Now the moments where the show is too faithful are dotted around throughout the 10 episode season and range in severity, and it mainly comes down to the show copying stories from the novel and pasting them into the episodes, beat for beat. In the grand scheme of things, these copy and paste storylines aren't that much of an issue, besides the lack of creativity. The issue arises when the copied aspects don't work for the story, since some things don't translate very well from page to screen. My main example of this comes from episode 4, A Home in Hell, which adapts both issue 4 and 5 of Gaiman's novel. This is the episode where Dream Hi. goes down to hell to retrieve his helmet from the demon that Ethel Cripps traded with and issue 5 is when John Dee escapes from the Mental Health Institute. For the most part, the episode mirrors the comics it adapts. Dream goes to hell, he's guided to Lucifer's palace by Squatter Bloat, Dream talks to Nada, Sin, Sin City was a mavia. The battle of imagination occurs and Dream gets his helm back, and in the midst of all that, John escapes, meets Rosemary and gets his ruby back. Sounds pretty short and sweet, right? But instead, it's stretched out into a 45 minute TV episode. The reason why it's an issue is due to the fact it brings the season's pacing to a screeching halt. Yo, you buying or you just stop in envy? And this is the case because the journey to Lucifer's palace is extended by Dream and Matthew's conversation about the power of Lucifer, which is unnecessary foreshadowing of the showdown between Dream and Lucifer. And a couple of easy fixes could have been made to make this episode not feel as long. My first suggestion being to take the the focus off of Dream's journey to Lucifer's palace, shifting the focus onto John's journey of finding the ruby, with the focus on John being done to flesh him out, instead of having him being a caricature of a crazy person like he is in the comics. <laughs> But that is a point for later. As well as this, we aren't really supposed to care about Dream, which again, is another point for later. Another example of the show feeling too tethered to its source material would be episode 5, 24-7. This episode adapts both issues 6 and 7, and here we see a more fleshed out John Dee use Dream's ruby to create a more honest world. Similarly to episode 4, this episode mirrors the issues it adapts to its own detriment, with the notable removal of the homophobia. No, no, we can't burn! the gaze as well as the uh the necrophilia Yikes. this episode does have a tendency to overstay its welcome by spending too much time trying to flesh out the side characters of the episode and while in concept this sounds really cool but in execution it drags out the episode's runtime for little to no reason like i get the whole point of fleshing out these side characters but a better way to go about it would be to keep the focus on john having him analyze the interactions of the patrons and noting down the self-defined lies present in each of these people when in reality the ruby isn't exposing lies it's ripping away the hope from the diner patrons there are a couple of more ways that the show remains too faithful to the source material with them both being visual and verbal callbacks now i don't really have an issue with fan service as a whole i think making references and callbacks to the source material is pretty cool in the sandman though the visual callbacks always seem to fall short when it comes to recreating the comic's beautiful illustrations with it being unable to capture the eccentric colors and detail even with the modern advancements of cgi and visual effects and the dialogue callbacks just sound like a nerd wrote the script while this show seems tethered to its source material at various points throughout the season, the writers do provide some very clever deviations. Some of the more notable examples are the early introductions of characters such as the Corinthian and Matthew, who aren't introduced until the second volume of the novel, and the first few episodes of the season also feature some neat deviations, which tie in with the prevailing themes of confinement and escape. The first notable one is the relationship between both Roderick and Alex Burgess. This relationship has changed due to the addition of Roderick having an old 
older son named Randall, who died in the Gallipoli campaign, which provides Rogshik with a motivation for wanting to summon death, as well as providing Rogshik with a motivation, it changes the dynamic between himself and Alex. This change in dynamic comes from Rogshik seeing Alex as inferior in every way to Randall, treating him more like a house slave rather than his own flesh and blood. This treatment keeps Alex confined to the shadows of both his father and older brother, the only escape from this confinement being his father's approval that he'll never get, so he kills him. <laughs> Mind-blowing resolution, I know. Another character who gets some spotlight who doesn't in the original comic is Ethel Cripps, the mother of John Dee and the mistress of Roderick Burgess, who runs away with Dream's tools once her relationship with Roderick turns sour due to her desire to have a baby. Yet she is prohibited to have her child and confined to a more servile role due to society's views on women. Why are you gotta be such a... A bitch. And our next topic of discussion is Johanna Constantine, who the writers turned from a geezer to a girl boss. During Constantine's brief stint in the original comic, he's not really fleshed out in any way, dumbing down his appearance to, oh my god, notable character appeared in niche comic, whereas the show fleshes out Joanna more, demonstrating to the viewers that she's confined by her memories, guilt and trauma, with this confinement being portrayed by the flashbacks to her past, as well as her awkward interactions with her ex-girlfriend Rachel, who has confined herself to her bed due to an addiction to Dream Sand. Dream then releases both Joanna and Rachel from their confinement, with him giving Rachel a peaceful death in her sleep, and making a vow to Joanna that her nightmares would be troubling her anymore, as some form of gratitude for helping him out. I personally interpret this as Dream realising that all humans aren't evil. I mean, I don't jerk off to little kids, but I don't know how to talk to people. Finally, we have our two main antagonists, the Corinthian and John D. I'll be talking about the latter first, since I find John more interesting, as well as there being a lot more to say. Now, the thing with John from the show and John from the comics is that these two are completely different characters. With John from the comics, he's kind of just mental for the sake of it. I'm the Joker, baby! There's no rhyme or reason behind his actions, he just wants to cause chaos because he's a devious guy, and if an antagonist can't be empathised with, it doesn't make for a very unfixing watch. While we have seen some of the things of characters like the Joker, I'd argue it's completely different, since Joker is doing everything in his power to psychologically torture Batman, to the point where he'd have to break his one rule in the hopes of finally stopping Joker. Whereas with John, his and Dream's dynamic lacks those personal stakes, however John from the series is a much more compelling watch, because he's He's written in a way where you can empathise with him, and this empathy comes from his thematic tie-ins. When we're first introduced to John, he's confined to a mental health institute and is receiving a visit from his mother Ethel. Throughout the conversation between Ethel and John, we begin to realise that John isn't just confined physically, but also emotionally, as he's confined by the lies present within his childhood, with this being conveyed via the numerous jabs toward Ethel, as well as his reminiscing about the past. This personal confinement is conveyed further during the drive with Rosemary, where John lambasts his recently deceased mother for not being a good person, as well as quizzing Rosemary about the relationship she has with her daughters. Then, once John has made it to the diner where episode 5 takes place, he explains his desire to bet the waitress, and with all three of these circumstances, it's clear to see that John's personal confinement has compelled him to endure this journey to create a more honest world, which demonstrates to me that John was well-intentioned, but his methods led to the harm of the dreamers. Now we can discuss the current and the truth is that not much about him has changed from the original source material, apart from him being more present in the narrative, introducing him a lot earlier than he originally was, as well as placing him in this puppet master-like role, where he's literally preying on Dream's downfall. The changes made to the Corinthians' introduction to the story actually work significantly better than the original comic, where he's introduced in the second volume and isn't really given much personality or character until the ending chapters of said volume. He has the same issue as John Dee from the comic, but to a much lesser degree, whereas in the series there is a motive behind the Corinthians' madness, and that motive is the desire to escape Dream's constrictive hold on him. Since he is confined by his status as a nightmare, the Corinthian is complicit in all of these schemes against Morpheus because he wants to change his fate so he can run rampant on the waking world. To boil it down, the deviations made within the TV show mainly revolve around fleshing out characters that were previously seen as one-dimensional, however some deviations aren't as welcome as the ones I've just discussed. 
And while I appreciate the show's use of deviation, I do believe that there is one aspect of the series which deviates too far from the source material, that being its characterization of Dream. In the comic, Dream is portrayed as a bit of a lone wolf. Most of the time when Dream speaks during the comic, it is usually an internal monologue to drive home to the reader that Dream is a loner. Yet for some reason, this show tries to make him a bit more social, with my main example coming from episode 6, The Sound of Her Wings, the episode which adapts both issues 8 and 13. Now in issue issue 8, there is a sense of distance portrayed between Dream and the sister Death, and he acts as a bystander when Death is performing her function, as well as occasionally exchanging dialogue. Now a couple of these aspects are present within episode 6, however the implied distance is completely removed. Death and Dream are framed very close together whilst on camera, and they have relatively long conversations during every other scene, with these conversations being there to mostly pad out the episode. These semi-consistent dialogue exchanges demonstrate to me at least, that the writers didn't understand the relationship these two characters had in the original novel, and while this was a good episode, it didn't adapt the original that well, unlike what some people would have you believe. As well as that fact, they kinda missed the point of the original, that we aren't supposed to care that much for Dream and the Endless. Dream's role in the novel's story is that he's an overseer, as well as an interconnecting factor. We're supposed to care about the Dreamers and those affected by Dream's function. He is not the focal point of the story, and the first half of the season understands this for the most part, with it focusing on characters like like Roderick and Alex Burgess, Ethel Cripps, Joanna Constantine, and John Dee. Once we get past the first half though, Dream becomes increasingly more involved in the story. While yes, the key focus of the second half of the season is on characters such as Rose Walker, Jed Walker, Lighter Hall, and the Corinthian. Dream is definitely more of a prominent presence in the second half. Some of his interventions are necessary though, such as when he sends Hector to the afterlife, along with him sentencing Gold to a few thousand years in the darkness, as well as reconnecting Jed to the Dreaming, and when he goes to the Serial Convention, which are three things which happen in the comics but under different contexts. And these deviations are quite compelling thematically, as I've demonstrated earlier. But to conclude this segment, the additional focus on Dream isn't a completely bad thing. I kinda liked his character arc which ended in him becoming more humble. However, this character arc could have been achieved without this additional focus, especially when you take into account Hob Gadling's inclusion. Now when it comes to the Sandman series, I don't believe it is a particularly bad adaptation, but it isn't necessarily a good one either. While I've demonstrated that it does some fantastic innovations and deviations from Gaiman's original novel, some of the innovations weren't very faithful to the author's original intention, while trying too hard to respect the author's original intention, which is quite the oxymoron. If you're adapting a story from a different form of media, the original media should be treated more like an inspiration rather than gospel. Treating the original as the holy grail limits innovative thought, and if a lack of innovation is present, then you might as well consume the original. With these adaptation complaints in mind, I don't believe they bring the Sandman's quality down to garbage. Instead, it shows that this piece of media is imperfect, but it isn't without merit either. Like I said in the opening, this show is one of the best pieces of comic book related media to be released last year, and I couldn't recommend it more if you can forgive the adaptation issues. Anyway, I've been unfixed, and I am a pretentious nobody.